everything in. Thank you. Um, hey, everyone. Glad you're here. This is our fifth plant talk of the winter. So we've done a whole bunch so far. I'll let you know if you miss any of them, how you can watch them. Um, they're all on our recorded and on, on our YouTube channel. So it's cool to go back and, and look at some um, if you didn't get them all. I'm Michelle DeRussia, the Communications and Events Coordinator for Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. I do a little pitch for membership at the beginning of these plant talks because membership is a super important part of what we do. We're a member based organization, which means our work is funded in part by donations from people who value sustainable landscaping and native plants and trees and garden making and all the educational outreach that we do. So if you are a member of NSA already, we say thank you very much for that. And if you're interested in finding out more about membership and all of the benefits that come with it, you can do that at plantnebraska.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Toby will drop a link in the chat in, in a minute um, for you to get there. So just so you know, we have one more winter plant talk coming up after today. So this is our second to last one. So if you want to register for that, um, it's going to be on Thursday, March 21st. It's about water wise practices for the home landscape. So we did a water wise practices that were, was a little more community focused a few weeks ago. And this one is gonna be particularly geared toward homeowners in the home landscape. So very applicable. Um, and you can register for that at plantnebraska.org. And as I mentioned earlier, we record all of these plant talks and I usually send out a link to the recording by the end of the day today. So you will get that and anybody who is not able to make it will get that. Um, so that's pretty much all for housekeeping. I would ask that you please mute yourselves just so we can keep um, background noise to a minimum. Justin and Bob will be doing a little talk and giving you some great information about drought and how to care for your, your landscapes during drought. And then we'll open it up to questions so you can put your questions in the chat. Um, if you want, when we open it up to questions, you can also unmute yourself and just ask your question. That works too. So today I'm going to hand it over to NSA tree and plant experts, Justin Evertson and Bob Hendrickson. Most of you are probably very familiar with them, um, but they are here to do our presentation today. So Justin and Bob, thanks for being here. Awesome. Yeah, Michelle, thanks. Can you can you hear me? All right. Yeah, we're going to have fun with this. Uh, Bob and I didn't know exactly what to do, but we both threw some PowerPoint program slides together, and then we thought we'd banter as we go along here. So if we get off track, Michelle, you might have to get us back on track. <laughs> us get off track? Come on, Justin. Yeah, yeah. Never. Never. And then, Michelle, I liked your comment up front about muting the speaker's my wife would tell you she wishes I had a mute button, so um, go ahead and mute me, she'd say. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen, and I'll through, go through a few slides. And I think, Bob, we would take questions as we go along, right? Yeah, for sure. We've got an hour to get through this, so uh, I'll share my screen. Hopefully, everybody can see this. Does that show up, Michelle? All right, yes, it does. I'm ringing. All right, let's do this. I'm going to throw. A, I'm going to focus primarily on big picture items around drought and how to make our landscapes a little more drought resilient. And then I think Bob will uh, share some similar thoughts. We'll banter as we go along, ask questions as we go along. But I'm going to fly through these pretty fast. I want to leave time for questions and answers and interaction as we go along. Right, so. Um, if you see that first slide, I'm going to shift to the next one here. This is just a reminder to me. Though I see some familiar faces on here. Those of you in the tree world, we did uh, allocate one CEU to both ISA and NAA certified arborists. So we will get to the end of this and take your information then, okay? So you got to stay to the bitter end, but it'll be worth it, I promise you. Okay. This is the reality here in the Great Plains, in my opinion. 
growing up out here, drought is reliable. <laughs> we have drought, it's gonna be here and it's gonna return. In my lifetime out here living in Eastern Nebraska, I can remember at least four very serious droughts. And it's interesting that they come on about 10 year increments here <clears throat> for me in Waverly where I live. I grew up out in Kimball though, and we would get droughts more frequently and, and more severe. So drought severity is relative. In Kimball, it might be a 10 inch moisture year. Here in Waverly where I live, it's a 20 inch moisture year. And then uh, my wife and I bought a property in Tennessee uh, near the Smoky Mountain woods. And that cabin in a drought year might get 35 inches of moisture. So, but that drought can still be impactful no matter how much uh, normal precipitation you get. So just be aware of that. <clears throat> I'll be curious to see what Bob thinks. I measure rain religiously in Waverly where I'm at. And the uh, 2023 was on track to be the driest year, 12 month record that we would have had, but we had moisture in December. So we bumped up to 20 inches of total moisture for the year, which was still about 10 to 12 inches uh, below normal. Wow. And I think something to be aware of that our droughts are probably going to keep getting worse as climate change shifts. And then let me highlight this uh, last bullet point here. 50 to 80 percent of summer water use in municipal water systems in the Great Plains, 50 to 80 percent goes towards landscape irrigation on a hot summer day. So let's keep that in mind. If uh, droughts get more regular and worse, we're not gonna be able to water nearly that much. So how do we develop landscapes that are more tolerant of that? Everybody likes a top 10 list. So I came up with 10 ideas uh, to get better drought tolerant landscapes. And I'll uh, throw these big concepts at you right up front here. First of all, think about design and aesthetic goals before you plant. What do you want the landscape to look like? Take advantage of to, uh, topography and soils and shade uh, to coax uh, drought tolerance out of plants. Place and arrange plants wisely. Plant properly and use good nursery stock. Use mulch and mulch properly. Know those soils that you're planting into. That's really critical and build those soils up organically. Keep your plants healthy as you go along. Be water wise. Primarily we're talking about with irrigation systems here and practice tough love. And then rethink the lawn. We did a whole lawn plant talk, right, Michelle? And you can find a link to that uh, in the NSA uh, videos that Michelle will highlight later. That's a whole subject matter, but that's critical to getting this right. And then number 10, the last but not least, wow, you better pick plants that are drought tolerant. And we don't suffer from a lack of them, but we'll talk about that just uh, a little bit. So here's the first thing I would say, be real honest about this when you're establishing your landscape. What do you want it to look like? Uh, if you have this uh, picture on the upper right in mind, this lush lawn with a few scattered trees, that's gonna be a water hog. So if you don't want to be a slave to water, your aesthetics are going to have to change a little bit. Just remember the reality, a lush summer green lawn is a water hog, and you probably just need to accept a little summer drabness if you want to do this better. If we were in Colorado, we would all be talking about xeriscapes. Xeriscapes, that's just a fancy term to say landscaping that is water smart. We're not trying to talk you into a rock-like landscape here on the upper left, but a Denver uh, landscape might be this lower left, which has still a lot of color and lushness to it, but it's water wise. Here on the right is more of a Midwest landscape, the one on the lower right. That's not what we're after. <laughs> <laughs> that looks artificial. I bet it's a water hog. And maybe you wanna shift to maybe not this bold of a solution, but the picture on the upper right emphasizing native prairie plants. Uh, that second bullet point I had, take advantage of your topography, shade and site opportunities. This is just a simple concept, but if you can plant in swales and low areas and drainage ways, that's half the battle. Those areas will get you through most of the summer with better soil moisture. North facing slopes, 
And it doesn't have to be a dramatic slope on a mountain. It can just be a gradual slope facing north, and that'll get you quite a ways. Take advantage of tree shade and building shade, things like that. I would say place and arrange plants wisely. One thing we've learned all the way along is mimic mother nature. She plants trees and other plants in groups. Let's do that with our landscapes. I believe this to my core, that our landscapes are most are both uh, aesthetically better, but also more drought tolerant when we group our plants uh, accordingly and maybe in similar water requirements, that kind of thing. Hey, and maybe Justin. in the home landscape, plant your landscape, your most important plants near water sources, right, Bob? Yeah, hey, Justin, in that one picture, if you go back to that, that's in Waverly there at Wayne Park on the left, right? Yep. Um, I'm curious, so you can see the trees all, all, all planted in there and there's grass underneath them. So do you start off planting this it's separate like that to make maintenance a little easier, uh, keep the weeds down? And then as these trees grow, will you incorporate that all into one big mulch bed or right. what's your plans down the road? Yep. And in fact, I'll show an image of the very spot oh, cool. that we've converted, thanks to Bob's help, to a sedge meadow. Uh, understory and it takes no water. Despite these record droughts we've had the last two years, we have not watered under these park landscapes and they've uh, trucked along pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. Sure. Yeah, good point, Bob. And maybe in that previous slide too, just take a look at this lower right image. That's from out in Alliance, Nebraska, where the homeowner converted the edge of his property to Blue Brahma uh, native prairie grass, but he still kept lawn to the interior and reduced a lot of the watering needs. I'm not going to belabor the point here, but here's that image, Bob, you were just talking about. Those trees now are under uh, providing an understory planting for sedges and shade tolerant ground covers. And I, I do believe that uh, massing them like this helps stretch that drought season reliability and greenness, in my opinion. So, Amen. Again, learning from Mother Nature, go walk in the woods, even in Nebraska woods. The trees and the shrubs are tight, and the grounds uh, cover plants below them or sedges or things that can tolerate that shade. Um, and they're, they're just doing their thing. They're fat and happy. They go through a lot of droughts. They don't always look perfect. Some things die in these droughts but it's way better than uh, maybe babying them along year after year. The fourth item was plant properly and use good nursery stock. And I cannot emphasize this enough with trees and shrubs. This is two thirds of the battle. <laughs> Pick a good plant, buy good nursery stock, plant it properly, get it off to a good start. And I'm, I'm telling you, most of your landscape problems, including drought issues, will go away over time. It's not perfect, but uh, we, didn't, we do need to try and get there. So start with good nursery stock. Buy from nurseries that know what they're doing and that they guarantee their stock and they're proud of it. The traditional options for trees, you know, are bare root, containerized, bald and burlap and spade dug. Most trees now are sold in containers, which has a set of problems we need to talk about. An emerging trend is grow bags. I'll show you a couple of pictures. Hey, and then Justin. just remember, this ideal root system is here on the right, our right. old friend Jim Cook, who passed away. That's what you would try to achieve with a perfect tree. Yeah, Bob. I was just going to say, I was going to bring up Jim, uh, our, our friend Jim there, uh, proud of, like you said, being proud of your nursery stock. Picture the size of that tree he's holding in his hands. First of all, he's able to lift it uh, without, you know, a forklift. But that root system being shoved into a five-gallon pot is what we're dealing with now uh, and asked to perform, right? I mean, yep. uh, it's just amazing how big of a tree can be in such a small pot. So I always say, choose the smallest tree in the biggest pot. Right on, Bob. And yeah, so the nursery industry shifted from bare root plants 30 or 40 years ago to container plants. And that's made it a little bit harder to get good trees, especially trees and some shrubs well-established in the landscape. There's a myriad of problems when trees are in the container too long. And this is just a quick picture of it. You've all seen these images, but beware trees in smooth-sided plastic containers. 
It doesn't mean they're necessarily they're guaranteed to be bad, but you're probably going to have to deal with uh, a root issue problem as you plant. So that's going back again, get this part right. I can't stress it enough. Take the time to plant the trees properly, get a, a wide spreading root system, no matter what your source or, or growing system. Uh, Bob can talk more about this, but he uses these in-ground uh, root trapper bags on the far left. And then there's other systems that are in the nursery industry now that are getting better root pruned trees. And the most important thing to pay attention to on the far right is it's a system. As Bob grows these, the starting from the acorn or the seedling, those uh, plants have to be air pruned so we get good branching and fibrous uh, root system. Anything you want to add, Bob? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, Justin, if somebody calls us or you go to somebody's place and why are all my trees struggling, you know, and, and say we're in the midst of a drought, the first thing we're going to do is go down to the base of that tree and see if we can find stem girdling roots or, or a bound up root system, because how is it going to take in water if the root system is bound up, right? So it's usually... Yeah nine out of 10 times a root, root issue that's causing that tree drought stress and not the actual yes. selection itself. You know, well, this tree can't take drought. Well, it can't take drought when it has a root system that looks like that. Exactly. <laughs> Nailed it, Bob. Thanks for adding that. So uh, once you get your good nursery stock, proper planting really is just wholly critical to this. And as Bob just mentioned, avoid planting too deep avoid stem girdling roots and severely girdling roots. And then here's what I would suggest to you. I know this is hard for everybody to do, but if you're only planting one or two trees at a time, plant the cool time of the year and then get those roots exposed. You might even soak them out in a wheelbarrow we see over here and shake the growing medium off because you want to see what the root system is doing. You want to get rid of bad roots and you want to spread it out and get it radially uh, spread out as you plant it. And the only way I know to do that is get it back to a bare root so I can see what's going on. That's yeah. ideal. Obviously, we can't always be ideal with it, but try wherever you can. And then timing is critical. I think just plant in the cooler part of the year. And then as Bob mentioned just a minute ago, man, the most important thing you got to do is plant the best root system you can. Don't worry so much about the top. Well, of course, you got to worry about the top but you better plant just as good of a root system as you do the top. And maybe it's better just to plant smaller trees or bare root trees uh, to get that going. Even You might even do something like plant some acorns or some walnuts. If you do it right, you end up with trees that establish quickly in the landscape, much more drought tolerant uh, than those trees that uh, came out of a container and have struggled. And then here was just my suggestion. You could even plant acorns. I did this in a growing study in Waverly to, to compare bur oaks growing from acorn versus nursery trees. These trees on the right now, in the far right of this picture, are all from acorns. We kept them in the nursery. There's three or four of them still alive. They've gone through incredible droughts, and they are now as big as this biggest tree in the background. We took out all the container-grown trees because they didn't do as well and they struggled. Huh. Number five, use mulch and mulch properly. Uh, we don't want this volcano mulch here on the lower right, but spread it out as wide as you can. And what they're learning now is plant a, a really good thick layer of mulch, uh, arborous mulch, six to 10 inches deep around new trees and your new plantings. Let it settle down. It won't stay six to 10 inches deep but that'll give you your best weed control plus your best preservation of soil moisture going forward. And then try to keep that mulch at three to four inches thick going forward. And then I think both Bob and I would say over time, convert those open mulch areas to uh, living ground cover. You know, Justin, that's quite a, a statement that I hadn't not necessarily heard that, that six inches or deeper to start with you know, we get a lot of one, a quarter inch rains, half inch rains that, you know, if it's newly planted tree, like in the center, let's assume that's newly planted and you did a nice six foot mulch ring around it. Are you saying I would maybe do six inches right up covering the new ball I plant or maybe keep that more like the three to four range and six inches more like that, that six inch deep towards the periphery of that mulch bed, right? Yeah, uh, great or, question. or does it matter? 
yeah, there, there used to be a lot of concern about mulch piled up to the base of the trunk. You don't want to do this volcano thing on the lower right, but I just got back from a conference where Linda Chalker Scott, a Washington State professor, has researched this closely and demonstrated that no mulch up against the base of the trunk is not a big concern. And like you mentioned earlier, Bob, most trees that are struggling in deep mulch, it's because they were poorly planted or poor uh, nursery stock. I You're see. absolutely right. You don't want to bury it under two feet of mulch. But she said the ideal weed suppression was six to 10 inches of fresh mulch. And then as you go forward, that settles down to three or four inches. Gotcha. Keep it top dressed going forward. Cool. Anyhow, that opened an eye, uh, a mindset for me to say, hey, put it on a little thicker initially if you can. Yeah, yeah. Know your soils and build your soils. So, hey, if you're planting in sand, they're going to dry out quicker, of course. Clay can be your friend. That's one thing I've learned in the Waverly area where I plant trees. If the clay is part of the soil, they they just uh, don't drought out quite as quickly. There are problems with clay soils, but that's a, a different matter here. And then Bob could talk all day about the importance of building healthy soil, organic matter, the role of humus and mycorrhiza in their soils. That organic matter is critical to tree and, and landscape health, but also really helps you stretch through a drought period. You, uh, the more organic your soils, the better. That's yep. the best thing you can do for them. There's no magic solution to pour into the soil. Don't use water polymers or anything like that. Just build organic matter. Amen. Keep plants healthy. And for me, the biggest thing here is of course, water them in a drought, but do no harm. <laughs> we just harm a lot of things in the landscape from the way we plant them to how we spray around them. We hit them with mowers and trimmers. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Be water wise and smart with the water. We could spend all day thinking about this. We already did a, a alternative a lawn program that you can get more information out of. Just be careful. And I would think both Bob and I would tell you to practice tough love with your landscapes. It doesn't mean you never irrigate, but irrigate less. Uh, use it as a tool to get you through a drought, not as a crutch to keep everything just lush and moist. And then if like you use a timer, don't just set it and forget it, you know, turn it on when the system is needed because of a drought. Yeah, use it as a manual operating procedure, manual right? Manual operation, <laughs> right. And then I think, Bob, you would say that same thing. Practice tough love, right? It's uh, Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a funny, fine line on... between um, practicing tough love and killing things, I guess. <laughs> right. Uh, hey, Justin, uh, Gary asked, do any of the soils in Nebraska have nematodes that are harmful to trees? I would assume there are. Uh, I'm not aware of that literature. I pay pretty close attention to it. Most of the nematodes are living things in the soil. Are either gonna either gonna be symbiotic to those plants or at least not harmful. And the one nematode I can think of that causes so much trouble is the pine wood nematode that comes in with the pine sawyer beetle and kills introduced pines. Hmm. So are you aware of anything, Bob, that's in the soil that's a problem? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. We have a nematode expert here on campus and uh Gary, I'll have to ask him, should are there any nematodes we need to be worried about? Not that I'm aware of, certainly haven't heard that about. And then and then our friend John, how you doing, John, uh, asks, I have seen mulch that over time and watering become almost like a blanket and seems to restrict yeah. water from soaking into the ground. I will take a rake to break that up. And Good I would point, say John. that, John, you know, you know, if you're using just chopped, what's the best mulch? People often ask, we just like chopped up trees, right? Where it's, you know, branches and yeah. leaves and stems and all that stuff. Versus some of that mulch, especially the bag stuff, really kind of does form a blanket and really adheres to each other. And those light rainfalls have become so critical, don't even penetrate it hardly. But yeah, John, my experience has been if it's just coarse ground up trees, not the, the best of appearance to the homeowner, but good enough, in my opinion, yeah. um, allows that air movement, allows that water movement and doesn't necessarily... Um, mat to the ground to restrict water flow. Is, is that what you would say, Justin? Yeah, right on. And the shredded cypress mulch is the big um, issue with that that's sold at nurseries and garden centers. So it's a very beautiful mulch, but it does uh, 
pancake together and it can actually shred, uh, shed water. So we're talking arborist wood chips here that are six to 10 inches deep. If it's that shredded fine stuff, colorized mulch, probably two to three inches and maybe break it up every so often, right? Uh, watering trees and shrubs, just a few thoughts. Uh, obviously, if you plant new trees and shrubs, be ready to water around them. The newest trees and shrubs, you're going to water frequently, but not very deep. You just got to keep that soil, uh, that root ball, that root area moist uh, for the first, and it might be three or four times a week in a dry drought stretch. And then the next year, maybe you're watering every other week. And then the third year, maybe just once in a drought or twice in a drought. Uh, that's how I kind of approach it. So uh, young trees, deeper watering less often. Established trees only primarily watering in a drought. And then maybe think about winter watering. We're in the throes of winter right now. For me in eastern Nebraska, I never water trees in the winter if I got them off to a good start in the fall. But I know in western Nebraska, they worry about this more, and especially with evergreens. So it wouldn't be bad to go out and water evergreens in the winter, young, new evergreens, if you can do it, if it's not too cold, because they do transpire water in the winter. Hey, Justin, somebody asked, Mary Lou asked, what age is considered an established tree? That's yeah, kind of really good answer, point. Isn't it? My personal opinion is like, if I planted, I like to plant in the fall. So I consider everything a newly planted tree through the next growing season, primarily in the late summer. That would be a newly planted tree. And then that next year, the second year out, I would back off on watering quite a bit, but I'd probably still water a few times in a drought. Yeah, and for me, I, I don't water. I mean, Jess and I were talking about this. It's like, wow, we kind of do the tough love thing. You know, it's like they always say, okay, your mature trees were in this big drought. You better be watering them. And I'm kind of shrugging my shoulders. How do I water a tree that's 80 years old, 70 feet high, and has a root system probably from border to border in my property? I'm not going to just water, you know, border to border my property just for the benefit of the tree. What I'm going to do is practice things under that tree. Yes. So when the drought does come, I'm not having to put down any supplement irrigation. And I'm like, sorry, buddy, tough love. You know, if you're going to die on me, you know, I'm not going to be a slave to watering you. And, and if we all have to water our mature trees during time of a drought, right. we're going to run out of water, right? Um, somebody else asked, Justin, Terry asked, are, are the recycled rubber tree rings okay as an alternative to mulch? Uh, recycled rubber, boy, the, uh, the Linda Chalker Scott research on that is do not use rubber as a living plant mulch. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense where I've seen it in playgrounds to make playgrounds safe, but that's about the only place I would use rubber mulch. Yeah, I would just say, don't do it, Terry. Just don't do it. Um, you want organic matter. You want that that interface between organic matter and the soil, not the insects and the microbiome that's there going, what is this stuff this human just put down? I don't like it. And then Michael asks, is using weed barrier with the mulch by by the tree a good step or not? Yeah, don't use weed barrier if you can avoid it, especially don't use plastic. Um, I, I wish I could show you all the, the presentation I heard just last week on this mulch and weed barriers. And uh, most weed barriers do not help you and they don't actually slow weed growth a year or two out. So um, I would not use them. Yeah, and again, yeah, I agree. And, and it, does it keep water from going in? It's not necessarily a drought tolerance thing per se, but again, that that I want that interaction between my organic mulch and, mulch and the soil to help build my soil and that weed barrier will prevent that. And if I have open ground, I want my ground nesting native bees to have access to open ground and they ain't gonna be able to build a hole uh, underneath that weed barrier. So yeah, just say no to that too. and. And and then and then Peter Pearl asks, are there specific soil amendments that I could add to fruit trees someone else planted a year ago? And I would say, Pearl, since they're already in the ground, you need to be about, think about creating soil amendments for a planting zone rather than soil amendments right over the top of where that tree was planted, like trying to work it in around the ball of the tree. Sure, you can try to do that, 
trying to avoid the root system. But if you create a, a big mulch zone, i.e. your mulch is going out to the drip line of those trees or beyond, then I'm going to bring in wheelbarrow fulls of compost and I'm just going to top dress it in that area. So as the root system is yep. growing away from that tree, it encounters that new uh, soil amendments because it's going to be hard to amend that area and work it in with the trees already in place, I would think. Yeah, the good thing about compost and mulch is it finds its way into the soil. If you mulch year after year or start off doing that, um, it helps over time. Yeah, that's why that's why ants are so important. People discard ants, but their nature's bulldozer moving that that soil in and out. Not only earthworms are doing yeoman's work, but don't forget our about our friends, the ants, with that, which I think people just love to kill rather than say what good are they. Yeah, I see a question here about coffee grounds. I'm not aware of there being any major problem with coffee grounds. It's an organic product that I compost everything uh, organically out of my house and I put it around my plants. I don't know if I'd throw it in the planting hole. No, but, uh, you, no, I, exactly. Angela, don't do that. But I do know a dude that was very adamant about visiting a coffee uh, place here in Lincoln. They would, he would collect their coffee grounds by the five gallon bucket for his compost pile, not to add to his planting tree hole or anything. G make great additive to your compost, especially if you're like me and you have more leaves than you do green material. Helps break down those leaves faster. Yeah, it's, it's great stuff for, for compost addition. Uh, one thing I wanted to reiterate now that I've, I've thought about, thanks for these questions, Bob, is when you're planting a plant, a tree, and you want that root system to have good soil contact, the problem with a, a plant in a container is like it's a ball in a socket. And so that you're just not getting good soil contact with the roots. But if you use do a bare root plant, it's out in, under, and within the soil itself. It's like a a hand in a glove as opposed to a ball in a socket. So yeah, I like that. Hey, Good Justin, stuff, uh, one other thing here on the chat, uh, Missy said a landscaping company planted five new trees this fall in a new shopping center. Oh boy. We have not heard this one before, Missy. Yeah, actually it's pretty much commonplace. They left the burlap wrapped around the trees, meaning folks at the base of the trees, you could see the burlap still tied around the trunk. Uh, and they can see it wrapped pretty tightly. I was thinking about contacting the building owners to let them know that it's not good for the trees. I'm not sure if they were being lazy about removing it or what. Yeah, what we always say is, because we get flack back from, from some folks that say, you know, that takes too much time and it doesn't harm the tree. Well, that burlap wrapped around the trunk is going to do nothing but girdle it. And literally in five minutes, you could solve this problem. You know, I pull back the mulch and I... You know, because Austin, you gave us some good advice. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Austin. Um, you know, I, I like getting my utility knife out. First, I'll untie it from the trunk. Then I'll expose the edge of that ball. And then I'll just use my utility knife to cut the top part of that burlap away because I'm not going to want to dig up my whole tree and try to remove it. But I do want to remove that top part that acts as a wick at, at pulling moisture away from the root system, right? Is that And that burlap is often treated nowadays so it doesn't break down very quickly. Haven't we seen burlap still in the ground, Justin, some 10 years later or more? Yeah, I can. Some of it gets treated and it doesn't degrade. Yep. Yeah. That whole topic of how do you handle bald and burlap trees? If I was doing it, I'd plant them in the cool part of the year and I'd bare root the tree. Uh, but that's too much work for most landscape companies. So I like the answers here. Just figure out where the right depth is, pull the burlap back and get it uh, covered with mulch. Getting back to watering, just real quickly here uh, in this slide that I showed, there's lots of ways to water around trees. You might use drip tubing. I like this old fashioned rainbird, uh, low, uh, low height sprinkler to use around trees. Uh, but that's just kind of what we're showing here. Do you want to use a tree bag, a gator bag down here in the middle picture? I don't use them. The best thing for me, what I do in our park in Waverly, we don't have anything under irrigation. We just bucket the water onto them. Sometimes we can use it from a hose end. But we don't have a lot of hose ends in the system. We bucket it on them when they're young. And to me, that's just as fast and good if it's mulched properly as using these gator bags. The gator bags aren't bad. They're designed to leak out the water overnight. So that's not a bad thing. But if you are mulching properly, 
you might as well just water that uh, mulch. Yeah, Justin, what I love about the bucket method too, oftentimes uh, trees are killed more so from overwatering a new tree yeah. than underwatering. And if you'd use that, it's easy to, to visualize, right? Setting a hose down and letting it run for 20 minutes, you have no idea how much water you put down. Whereas doing a five gallon bucket approach, sure, it might be more work, but most trees, five, 10 gallons, that's all it needs. And and, uh, and I'm talking at planting or that first year right. um, to common. keep it to keep it watered. Hey, Justin, Neil had a good question. I have seven 15 foot white pines grouped together. How much should I water them? There's always one of the trees with some of the needles yellowing. Not sure if it's I'm watering too much or too little. So he's has seven 15 foot pines, meaning they've, they've probably been in the ground for a little while. I know white pines grow fast. I like how they're grouped together. And I would say, Neil, if you, if that's not, if they're grouped together and you don't have a mulch zone under all seven of your trees, man, that would be my first thing I'm thinking about is I'm going to create a zone so all seven of my trees are under one big mulch bed. So there's no grass competition. Yeah. And and the needling is just kind of it kind of concerning on 15 foot trees that they would be needling already, but white pines, it's a natural process of them shedding some of their old needles. You'll often see uh yellowing needles on on white pines in the fall, right, Justin? They're just kind of yeah. over uh renewing their growth, if you will. Um white pines but, are a real conundrum, Bob. We're seeing a lot of decline around here, even in mature white pines. And the guess is. It's not as much drought as it is a shifting climate. Our heat is really hard on some trees in the summer, and droughts are certainly part of that, but um, that's a head scratcher. No doubt. Avoid windswept areas, right? <laughs> yeah. There yeah. are wonderful white pines around here, so don't give up on them. But like if you have one tree out of five struggling, my guess is there's a problem with that root system. Yeah. Let's wrap this up. Bob's got a lot of great slides. So I just wanted to throw a few species at you. Use drought tolerant species. We don't suffer from a lack of species to choose from trees or shrubs or perennial plants. That's not the problem. The problem is more availability and how we establish them in the landscape. And remember most trees and shrubs, I'd say 80% of what we use has good drought tolerance if you've planted them properly and gotten them off to a good start. Some species just take it to a whole new level. And then genetics and provenance is critical. Michelle might talk about this more at the end, but the statewide arboretum has all kinds of plant lists for you for drought tolerance. So I'm not gonna spend too long on that, but I'll show you a few plants that I would really get you to think about and start by thinking our Great Plains here. We are in a part of the world where we get drought and heat. And so a lot of our native plants are adapted to this. Let's look at those and try to use them more, like the bur oak. Holy cow, that's a drought-adapted tree. The chinkapin oak, I haven't found one that has droughted out on me yet. And there are so many oaks we could talk all day about it in western Nebraska. Please start using that gamble oak more. It is so fantastic. We don't use it enough. And then on the right is the Buckley's oak from Oklahoma and Southern Kansas, and a fantastic tree for heat and drought tolerance. Hackberry, it's the king of drought tolerance. One cool thing about the hackberry is they can go summer dormant, too hot, too dry. They just drop their leaves and say, I'll wait till next year. Sugar maples aren't generally very drought tolerant, but if you pick one from the Caddo Canyon of uh, central Oklahoma, you're gonna get one with good drought tolerance. Provenance, the seed source is critical to these things. There are a lot of elm trees that we can think about, really drought tolerant. The Ohio buckeye is another one that can do summer dormancy and drop its leaves in a, a really drought period. Evergreens are kind of hard because of our shifting climate towards summer heat and high humidity, but we have native evergreens that are fantastic. The ponderosa pine, the limber pine, which grows on bird poop and dust in Western Nebraska and survive droughts that you can't imagine. And look at them out there in, in the Western part of the state. Nobody likes a red cedar, but wow, drought tolerant. Rocky Mountain juniper, drought tolerant. Should we plant spruce? I'm personally not a big fan of spruce going forward, but in Western Nebraska, Black Hill spruce, Colorado spruce are still good choices. In Eastern Nebraska, probably more Norway spruce. And then there are so many good shrubs. If you look at our native shrubs like American plum, silver buffalo berry, some of the viburnums, coral berry and snowberry, 
if you go west, look at mountain mahogany, wavy leaf oak, some of the sumacs, rabbit brush, Apache plume. We do not suffer from a lack of uh, suitable plants if we just take the effort to get them. So that's going to do it for what I had to say. We really need to get Bob going on here, but uh, oh, this is great. monitor questions here. This is so great. Yeah, Justin, I, I was just looking at one. I, oh, man, where did that go? Oh, so a crew came in, you know, planted trees, left the burlap on this person. And Steve said, I agree that it should have been removed as much as possible. Um, so, so I had to tell them to remove it and remove the wire cage. The crew wasn't pleased and said the root ball might fall apart. And that's what the reason these baskets and these burlap is kept on the trees, folks, because it so-called compromises the root system. If we take the basket off, the ball might fall apart. We can't guarantee your tree if the ball falls apart. And what I always tell the retailer that tells me that, one, they say we we it would cost us too much money i.e labor if we did it that way and i'm like well what is a professionally planted tree anyway is it just sticking a hole in the ground and yeah. plant it not even thinking about yeah. it heck my kid uh, uh, anybody could do that uh, you know plus professionally planted means i'm taking that basket off i'm taking that burlap off and if your ball's falling apart you need to go back to your grower and say my b and b has no roots in it because the ball fell apart not because of anything else if the ball falls yeah. apart you're going to soon discovered oh wait a minute i just spent four hundred dollars on this tree that has no roots hmm is that the retailer's fault no it's not but where they ordered the trees from is because they they don't have the yeah. magic bullet that looks inside that root system right so it's got to change with the grower. Just just be cognizant about not yelling at your retailer because they're not growing the trees. They're ordering them in. So, all right, Justin. Yeah, so there's, I don't know if we covered quite all of them. Somebody asked for the maximum depth of, of mulch around a tree. Yeah, I saw that. You know, you don't want to bury it for sure, but they're figuring out that the depth uh, isn't as critical as we used to think in terms of burying it. So don't be afraid to pile it on pretty thick on newly planted trees and shrubs, not at the base of the plant, but, um, and then it'll settle. We're talking about arborist mulch that settles pretty quickly. Yeah, I like how you say it, arborist mulch, <laughs> the good stuff, the good yeah, none stuff. of that shredded stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, okay? Yep. Okie dokie. Yeah, my big thing is, uh, you know, we've all seen this picture, right? A squirrel saying, I'm sick of this heat, sick of this drought, you know, but I think uh, Justin's point of relaxing and working with Mother Nature is a good one, right? Uh, mass trees and turf, you know, Justin already went over this, so I was glad he did. I think that's the critical one, massing trees and, and shrubs together, separating from the turf, drink ground, ground covers instead of turf cover, strive for biological diversity, and and more and more people are looking for you know lawns that have hey keep I'm, I'm i'm living with the weeds or maybe planting some things with their lawn for some biological diversity like clover who would who would have thunk it that we're looking back at replanting clover in our lawns like yeah. we did back in the 50s no clover um and of course try to reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides i haven't used insecticides on my place in probably 25 years and probably never will again it's just not necessary because I have a diverse mix of plants. Um, and then as Justin said, I think Justin, this might've been a picture yeah. from Waverly where he had two trees that were all by their lonesome surrounded by turf grass and then mowing that year after year, week after week, month after month cr creates compaction under those trees. So the best long-term survival for those trees and for water management is to incorporate plants underneath them. And uh, now all of a sudden those trees have a huge mulch bed rather than maybe just a one foot mulch bed right around the trunk to keep the mowers away. This is gonna be more uh, beneficial to that tree's uh, root system as it moves out away from the trunk, right? So create a planting zone. And then that planting zone as you're creating it could also be amended, you know, bringing in an inch or two of compost before you lay down the wood chips, smother that grass. And then people often are say, what can I do to benefit wildlife? And that's planting things at, at different heights you know, uh, bird lovers, wildflower lovers, they'll tell you that we, what we need is what we call edge species or these edge environments where prairie meets meets the woods and, and vice versa is known as edge. And those edges often create, uh, have stair-stepped vegetation, which means you have, you know, some, maybe some herbaceous ground cover, some smaller shrubs, larger shrubs, small trees, large trees, 
all getting along together. And then when those leaves fall off the trees, because you have this huge planting zone now all in here, I don't ever have to rake this. I like that. I don't ever have to water this. I like that even more because all those leaves that are dropping, I'm not raking away. And a lot of people do. They rake those leaves away, even falling in a place like this because they think it's going to harm the plant. It does not harm the plant. It's been nature's way forever. I've seen plenty of good daffodil bulbs, whatever the case may be, force their way right through that mulch and still do their thing. So try to plant in groups as best you can. Of course, homeowners can create low mow areas with prairie species. Uh, more and more gardeners are doing this, you know, creating uh, prairie style landscaping, uh, not only in, in homes, but also in businesses. I think these big corporate campuses that we have could really set the bar and, and set the stage for a new way of rethinking landscaping around corporate campuses, whether it be a bank. And a good example of that here in Lincoln is the Assurity Life Building down there at 23rd and P. Man, what an awesome landscape. Um, and if you talk about the people that manage it and, and uh, count the budget, their water use, uh, they eliminated a sprinkler system that they used to have there. So they're saving a lot of money on water. They're saving a ton of money on fertilizer that they used to have to do, insecticides because they have disease and insect problems. So you can convince somebody to do it if you convince them in their pocketbook. And then the, the following is you now you have a drought tolerant landscape. And then, of course, meadow and prairie plantings create low maintenance areas that add ecological value. But these densely planted areas like these also help reduce and filter stormwater. Oftentimes we get those four inch downpours, right? So it may say we got 29 inches of rain this year, but of that 29 inches of rain we received, how much of it came in a four or five or a six inch downpour? And, and most of that water maybe ran off and didn't even penetrate the root zone. So if we create more landscapes like this, the water that does fall has a chance to infiltrate into the system. That's an important thing, right? You know, we can talk about drought tolerance to our blue in the face, but if you've got compacted soils and inorganic soils, it's all just going to run off and and it just doesn't help. So we're, we're trying to garden to make every drop count. Right. And I like to use, like Justin said, use nature as a model. These pictures were taken at Indian Cave State Park. And I'm like, oh, look at that woodland flocks and uh, a wild columbine blooming together underneath an oak tree. I think I'll mimic that in my home landscapes. So, and, and then over here, these are native sedges growing along the base of this oak, tough as nails. It was dry, really dry there. These lust soils are really dry. And the, and the uh, native sedges were just shrugging their shoulders going, whatever, we got this. So what a cool thing using nature as a model, having sedges and native uh, woodland wildflowers. And, and that's if you're dealing with a lot of trees and shade in your landscape, obviously. This is a scene I saw many years ago in Pahuka, and that is uh, sacred Pawnee ground north of Cedar Bluffs along the Platte River Bluffs. And a person that owned the land brought us out there and said, what is this? And I was like, I don't know, but I'm going to find out because this is a look we need in our park systems. This is a look we need in our, in our home landscapes that are dealing with a lot of trees. This is a woodland area uh, with nothing but Longbeak sedge in it. And Longbeak sedge, lo and behold, has become kind of a popular plant. I never thought it would take off, but people are seeing this as a, as a lawn alternative under trees. Yes, it's a little coarse. Yes, it's a little gangly. And I did get called in with my home landscape by the Weed Authority. And I'll show you, this is my, uh, my house. And you can see we kind of adhere to that vertical landscaping. Can you tell we love trees? Well, I didn't plant any of those. I inherited them. But this was all lawn. It was a hill, difficult to mow. And you can see this is my only re remaining piece of lawn just because I haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> but what I'm going to have is basically a path running by this, this perennial bed here. And well, actually, I did change it. So now I just have a path right here. And this has all been converted uh, to landscaping uh, right here. So anyway, back along this stretch, if you can see my cursor where there's a big red oak right here, I couldn't grow grass very well over there. It was kind of a area that was just really a utility area, never really utilized it, but I got sick of mowing it. So I converted it over to a sedge meadow with long beak sedge, wanted to give that same feeling, that same look that I saw at Pahuka, which is sacred Pawnee ground. I'm thinking, man, uh, I can I can kind of mimic that 
that uh, sacredness to the land. So this area looks like unmowed grass, but it's a sedge meadow. And I could go in here and plant bulbs or spring of spring beauties like wild columbine and woodland phlox. More importantly, the leaves that fall off my tree, I haven't raked under here in eight years. I haven't watered under here in eight years and I haven't mowed under here in eight years. The plants, the new growth comes right up through the old growth. And I wondered, scratching my head, am I gonna have to mow this back? I'm like, I gotta let it and see what happens because if I don't let it, I will never know. But by leaving it, much to my surprise, they came up right through it. And I've seen bumblebee nests in these areas. So it's really working. And then of course we use the shrubs, this layering effect uh, lots of songbirds. Uh, we have birds nesting in our property because of uh, all of the diversity. And then the front yard uh, there, I just converted all this that used to be grass, did a retaining wall. And then this is just shade loving plants. And, I, and you can see there's hostas in there, nothing special. But I also don't supplement irrigate this. I don't irrigate it at all. Uh, it's my tough love approach. If you're going to die on me, there's plenty of other good plants I can put in your place that won't die on me. So tough love has paid off. And then there's the backyard. You can see kind of the back side of that fence with the more layered effect. The only area we really water is our vegetable garden area and the potted plants. Everything else I, I don't irrigate, period. Root systems of prairie plants, right? You've probably all seen this image before uh, showing how deep prairie roots go. It's kind of hard to tell. Let's see this, where my cursor at, this is 10 feet below the ground right here. So something tells me plants that grow 10 feet below ground with roots are very drought tolerant, right? But we're looking at, at what, uh, two to three to four, four feet here. Most of them are down that four feet level. There's, that's pretty good drought tolerance. Whereas, you know, your typical turf grass, here's a turf grass root system compared to little blue stem or turf grass compared to switchgrass, right? And here's a switchgrass that's been dug up. So you can see that extensive root system. And this baby's doing nothing but adding organic material to the ground because every year, 30% of that plant's root system is replaced. A third of that root system dies and is replaced by new roots. So those dying and decaying roots create channels through the soil that allow rainwater to penetrate it deeply. So those same channels can be demonstrated in a woodland garden with those sedges because they have deep root systems too. So uh, it, it opens channels and it reduces the runoff uh, when we get those five to six inch downpours. And as Justin pointed out, the mycorrhizae, very important, uh, you know, a mutually beneficial relationship, but mycorrhizae aren't gonna show up in dead soil. Mycorrhizae needs good living soil to live off of. What feeds mycorrhizae? It's not just the wood chips you put down, but the plant material that you plant in there. Uh, a, a mulch bed under a tree with no plant material is worse uh, for drought tolerance than a mulch bed under a tree with a plethora of plant material. And you, our mind kind of thinks that, well, wait a minute, wouldn't all those plants underneath the tree kind of steal too much moisture from the tree? No, they're all living in concert together, uh, research is showing. They're tapping into each other's root systems helping each other in times of stress and times of drought. And it's it's a huge thing. And we can create that same uh, thing at home, that, that fungal highway, if you want to call it that. And I know there's a lot of words here, but folks, when I learned this, I was like, wow, okay, this explains the why of it. The single fastest way and the most effective way to build soil organic matter is a process called carbon induction. It begins with plants photosynthesizing, right? The leaves up above, they're photosynthesizing and it produces what's called photosynthates. 25% of that plant over its entire lifetime of its total photosynthesis, total sugar production, out through it goes out through the root system to feed soil microorganisms. So a healthy living plant shares its bounty. It shares in the wealth, feeds those soil microorganisms, which in turn make your soil healthy, organic, and be able to resist drought. When plants become healthy enough and we have good bacterial digestion, the plants are absorbing significant portion of their nutrition as microbial metabolites. I know that's boring. I remember taking soil science in college and I was like, who knew dirt was so complicated? Well, dirt is that stuff under your fingernails. Soil is that living stuff you have on the ground, right? 
the plants become very energy efficient, meaning they don't have to, they're not as stressed if they're with their buddies. So this kind of explains it. So a plant re releases what's called exudates, which is sugars and proteins out of its root system. The bacteria and the fungi in the soil consume those exudates and protists and micro, micro animal eat bacteria and fungi and release what they don't use. So they're eating that bacteria and fungi. What they don't use, get this, it's actually fertilizer. So it becomes plant food. So the waste of the bi microbial activity, the bacteria and fungi that you need in your soil, dead soil doesn't work. But if you have a, a plethora of bacteria and fungi, i.e. not basement subsoil, the plants are actually going to feed each other with their with their the waste product that the bacteria and fungi eat. I hope that makes sense. I just think it's really cool. So eliminate mowing areas or reduce their size. Use grassy areas like I do for your pathways. It my grass is basically from from uh, away from me to get from point A to point B. <laughs> um, okay, I know we're out of time here. We got four minutes left. We could take some questions, but real quickly, I want to show you. This is Joslyn Art Museum. Our friend Clay Johnson used to take used to take care of this. Fortunately, he's no longer there, but. He inherited this place that used a lot of water, used a lot of pesticides and fertilizers. And he decided, I'm going to do something simple like mow high. And we talk about it a lot, but you see how gorgeous that grass is, how full and dense and lush and healthy it is. Um, that is mowed at five feet high, or I'm sorry, five inches high. Can you tell that it is mowed at five inches? I waited for the pause on purpose. No, you can't, right? So you back away and it just looks, it looks like any other lawn. Um, so mowed it at five inches on the rare occasion. He spot sprays or hand pulled some weeds. They're almost all next to the curbs and sidewalks where the grass wasn't dense, right? He has virtually no weeds to deal with. And he, then he can also say to the administrator, oh, we don't need to order a thousand dollars worth of uh, pesticides this year. And the administrator says, I think I love you. In addition to that, the turf had serious fungus problems before I started caring for it organically. This is my fourth year doing it. And for at least three years, I've had zero fungus problem and I never use fungicides. So it just as simple as mowing high uh, really uh, uh, made a difference in this landscape. So I'll stop there and give a shout out to Brad and, and uh, Stephen for doing their sedge lawn alternatives, uh, or I'm sorry, their lawn alternatives presentation with a couple uh, plan talk a couple weeks back. You can find that, um, and I'm sure uh, Michelle shared already, but just go back to Plant Nebraska and find the plant talks and you can re-listen to that. Uh, really want you, this is where, where I hope we go in the next 10 years. If I had my way, every park in town would be nothing but sedge and prairie meadows and we'd pack it full of trees and, and people would actually be in parks once again. That's all I got. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have any. Bob, there are a couple of questions. I answered a couple about uh, leaves and mulch, but there's one here about uh, spacing of sedge meadow plants and how do you establish long beak sedge in a barely growing shady grass area? Okay, yeah. Um, so, George, I see your question there. Yeah, the long beak sedge, you can do it from seed, George. And I know people that start off with a few plants and then and it'll seed around and create that 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 landscape for you if budget's a concern or you can just say you know i'm going to plug them and i would say as far as spacing judy you know it depends you know i i've gone 12 inches i've gone 18 i've gone two feet and i think it just depends on budget if or how many plugs i can get right and so if i'm after you know keeping my budget tight and who isn't i'm probably going to space them two feet apart and then in between the spaces i'm going to let the leaves fall right as you can see in this picture they're like bunch grasses with space in between them. And I'll show you here um, as we're going forward, just quickly, uh, I don't know if I can, it's not working for me. Why is it not working? There we go. Um, so as you get, see there's some more sedge lawn alternatives. You see the leaves just fall in between the clumps and the clumps come right up through the leaves. Uh, there's another shot of it. So it's actually, I think looks rather attractive in the fall when the leaves are falling. But yeah, you know, 12 inches, 18 inches, two feet, there's really no magic number. The, the, the tighter you space them, obviously the quicker they're gonna the touch. But in these areas in between, cause you could see these are planted around two feet apart. 
Um, I could easily plant some bulbs in here for some spring color, or I could do, you know, go more native and do woodland flocks and, and wild columbine and wild geranium and awesome plants like that to give me some, some pizzazz between those clumps. Hopefully that answers your questions. There is a question here about a purplish or reddish uh, plant that I thought might be Siberian squill or a wild onion, but somebody else said maybe, um, what am I looking for? Oh, they have an image of it? No, I've lost my, oh, and then Steve Rothy said it might be purple lovegrass. That's oh, not cool. a plant that's typically four to eight inches tall, so that's. Yeah, purple lovegrass, certainly I would not plant it as a, a, a shady lawn alternative. That would that be a it, it wants full sun. And uh and I see Mary's question, is there a grass that grows under a deck? Yeah, that's a tough one, Mary. And that because that deck probably isn't getting a whole lot of moisture under there either. I would say don't think about turf grass, your your typical conventional turf grass. I would go with with a sedge. And there's a runner out there called Pennsylvania sedge. It can take some drought, but man, wow. that's a tough one under a deck. You know, um, if it's getting moisture, meaning if you have, you know, the, the the wood of your deck where when it rains, it's obviously penetrating in the, in the slits in the wood, getting it there. But man, few and far between. I, I wouldn't want you to stick a whole lot of money into it. I would say try an area out first and see how it works. I don't know what else to tell her, Justin. Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> oh. That might be some, that might be the one spot where you use rocks or something to just cover the ground and mm -hmm. live with it. That and whole... sometimes I'm picturing this deck that it's visible to them. You know, that's why it's bothering them. Yeah, that, that it's visible. But in other words, Mary, if the deck's way up above that zone, i.e., you know, kind of a two-story deck or whatever, and you're down at ground level, by all means, I would do a shade a shade love and sedge underneath there. That that long beak sedge that, that you saw the picture of man that baby's drought tolerant it could grow in the crack of a sidewalk people asked where should they get arborist mulch and michelle chimed in here that the city of lincoln has free piles at holmes lake i think they also do out at the transfer station the tra um, refuge yeah. transfer station and then most cities or excuse me most arborists if you call them we have one in Waverly that just drops us mulch when they're around, and that's been good for us. No doubt, and those tree companies will do it for homeowners too. You know, it just depends on the tree company. Some will say, "Yeah, we'll do it free." Most will charge you a minimal fee to save them from having to go yeah, to the right. transfer station. So it's yeah, it's worth calling. Uh, there's also, I think, a big pile here in Lincoln at uh, First and Cornhusker there at uh, what is it, Oak Lake Park or, or whatever. Um, always, always a pile out there too. I put a note in here for those of you who are certified arborists, please type in your name, certification number, and your community, and we'll gather those in the chat and report them. Cool, cool. So we're going to uh, wrap up, I think. I think we got most of the questions. Um, there was, there's one left here. We'll just answer that last one. Um, well, there's two, actually. Pine mulch, what are your thoughts on that? And also... Does arborist mulch risk transfer of tree disease? So we'll answer those two and then we'll we'll wrap it up and see y'all on March cool. 21st. Yeah, mulch, cool. uh, pine mulch, I think, or excuse me, pine needles are fine if they're not. That's the one thing you wouldn't want to put down 10 inches deep. Right. Let them lie under a tree and add them to a land. They can improve your acidic nature of your soil and then definitely... Arborist mulch, one downside. I wouldn't think that you're going to transfer disease, but one thing I've run into is transferring weeds every so often. Like I've gotten weedy tree of heaven in my a time or two, and that's been oh, a man. frustration. So just beware. Sometimes it's not the cleanest stuff. But yeah, I, there's really nothing out there to be afraid of, Denise, that, that or wait, uh, I got the wrong person. Sorry. Uh, yeah, there's there's no research that's shown diseases can be transmitted from that ground up wood chip mulch to a tree, right? I mean, I, that I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah, so no worries there. Um, you know, in the pine needle mulch, I know especially if you're out in western Nebraska tuning in, man, it is a no brainer for western Nebraska because 
you know, you have a lot of pine trees, first of all, so it's more of a, a available resource. But I know our friend Lucinda Mays out in Shadron, it's her favorite mulch on her perennial beds is uh, is pine needle mulch. And she'll put down a couple inches and that's uh, been enough. So, yeah, uh, definitely. I, I'm of the belief of, you know, mixing it with something else, you know. But if you got a lot of pine needles and you're swimming in them, yeah, mix it with your deciduous trees, leaves, and you got yourself a, a beautiful mulch. And it's funny, everybody asking about uh, uh, wood chip mulch. I have really stopped doing wood chip mulch at my home property for probably the last 10 to 15 years. I got tired of it. Yeah. And my leaf mulch has become my wood chip mulch now. And I'm really happy I made that switch. I'm not having to trudge off to the dump to get wood chips. And I think I just got tired of wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow. Me too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, maybe it's just because we're old curmudgeons now, right, Justin? Or, yeah. or maybe we just figured out why go through all this work when it, 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 I've got this this gold right on my trees. So, uh -huh. Bob, do you just rake the mulch, the leaves up and push it onto your beds? Or do you, like, shred it up and make it mulch? Yeah, it good question, Michelle. I think certainly I know folks that will, like, say you got more lawn than you do because you saw my home landscape. It's like, it's, yeah, you don't have that it's like, you know, the leaves can fall and I don't have, I just shrug my shoulders. I, really, my work is getting it off the little turf grass I do and then keeping the curb edge clean because you don't want your neighbors to go, this guy's being lazy. Yeah. They see me out there raking leaves on the street, right? <laughs> and yeah. those leaves I'm raking off the street or the curb edge early in the season, not waiting in too long, right? So they, because they get heavy if, if you let it rain in that curb edge. So I'm taking those leaves and then moving those to areas where the leaves aren't dropping directly on the bed. And then and people may say, well, I, I don't want two foot of mulch leaves on my perennials. No, I mean, common sense tells you, you kind of peel off some of that as they're emerging in the spring and maybe leave a six inch layer of loose leaves down below. And and by the by June or whenever, when the plants are coming up, you don't you can't even see that mulch anymore. The plants are all yeah. covering it up. Yeah. yeah, and okay. for me, Michelle, I take the, I take my leaves and I pile them in three or four spots, uh, and then the, let the winter work on them, and then I'm moving them out in the sp spring. Ooh, I like that. At least the oak leaves that are harder to break down. Yeah, yeah. they kind of take forever. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you guys so much. Um, everybody, if you're here for CUs, put that information in the chat. Um, our last plant talk for the season is March 21st. So you can go to plantnebraska.org and sign up there if you haven't done that already. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming today and absorbing all this great wisdom. And we'll see you soon. Toby and Michelle, please save the chat uh, text and send it to me and I'll gather those CEUs. All right. Uh, 